we, I want to say to some degrees, we had it here first. We have discussed Zunino almost a week ago on this very show. We're going to talk about him. We're going to talk about some more information that dropped today. Get a little bit into the trade market as well, all on Locked On Guardians. You are Locked On Guardians, your daily podcast on the Cleveland Guardians, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Locked On Guardians. I want to thank you for making Locked On Guardians your first listen today and every day, wherever it is you get podcasts. Uh, if you're tuning in to find out about Mike Zanino, this is definitely the place to be. We'll be getting into it on today's show. I am Jeff Ellis, one of the hosts of Locked On Guardians. Uh, based on some of the comments today, uh, the least favorite host. Uh, people were mad today in the comments uh, for a variety of reasons, either missing out on Murphy, not liking Zanino, or just general unhappiness. So we're going to kind of cover all of that today. But I am Jeff Ellis, your least favorite host of Lockdown Guardians. I'm Justin Ladd. I don't know how people feel about me. I'm just happy to be rated. How's that sound? I don't know. If it dislike no, you're, me, you're, dislike you me. are liked. Every single time something comes up, I am the, I well, I interrupted you. So there we go. That, that's that's a strike. I don't know. I, think I people guess think I... we don't like each other. I, I got to be honest. Sometimes the comments make it feel like, like there's a competition here. And I want to be like, you know that we like, agree on 90% of things and have like never had a fight in our lives. Yeah. It's just eggnog and Will Smith movies. And even I've had to recant some of my Will Smith love after the, the slap her around the world, unfortunately, but uh, I, I'm just happy to be rated. I guess I, I guess if I'm, I'm the baby face, which uh, I'll take that for now, but you never know when I might make my heel turn. Yeah. You know, you might start talking about showcases on the show. Now this is why people are going to think I hate you. Yeah. Yeah, um, we're eventually gonna have to let people people who listen to the podcast know about that. But we should probably wait wait for another day because we've got a lot to get. To we have today. a lot to get talk about. So a lot of people are mad about Mike Zanino. And uh, listen, I'm gonna keep it short and sweet. If you saw my tweet uh, before we recorded today, listen, all the people out there like he's not an upgrade over Austin Hedges. I literally went to Fangrass, went from 2018 through 2022, made the minimum at bats a thousand or minimum plate appearances a thousand. The worst hitter in baseball over that time, Austin Hedges, who has a runs created plus of 54. Lewis Brinson, who has struggled to find a job, is two. Billy Hamilton, Garrett Sampson, who was cut. Orlando Arcia, who has been a backup and a massive disappointment for his career, uh, round out the top five. Uh, with such luminaries as Alcides Escobar and uh, Joe Panic, you know, it, it's not a good list. And he is the worst. And for anyone out there saying that Zanino uh, has a, you know, uh, what's the other thing? Oh, complaining about Zanino's strikeout rate, which is 7% higher than Hedges, which is, you know, again, not good. But, like, it's not like Hedges wasn't a free swinger who he hits under 200. Well, Hedges... Uh, Hedges hit 163 this year and has a career 189 batting average. And you know, is better than him in every offensive category possible or imaginable. Is he a Sean Murphy level upgrade? No. I also tweeted out today, like the top tens uh, in terms of war at catcher over the last three years, not counting 2020 because it was a weird year. And there it's amazingly inconsistent outside of guys like Murphy and real Mudo and like the cream of the crop. We can be sad. We missed out on Murphy, but Zanino is an upgrade. Right, he's definitely an upgrade on potential. I mean, there's definitely a world here where this ends up being an abject disaster, and they have to hope that Bo Naylor is ready to take the reins and that he's everything they think he can be. Why I think so highly of him, um, I don't know. The thoracic outlet syndrome issue is usually a pitcher's issue, and it affected mostly his. Le- it was from his left side, so it was his non-throwing side. So. Um, I guess that I would assume that's going to affect his swing more than his throwing in theory, I suppose. I'm not sure. This mm-hmm. is a very weird injury. Um, it's not a good one. Um, I don't know what I know. They're, they're very limited data and results on position players coming back from it or even having it in general. But uh, talent alone, it's definitely an upgrade. It's he's a better hitter. He's got more power. He walks you know, a fair amount or he used to walk a fair amount. Maybe his walks have dropped off, but um, yeah, the hedges has nowhere, never, never gotten close to what the power output. So, you know, has, Nino has a 
146 career homers and Hedges has 66. And Zanino has like one more, two more, se- one more full season played than Hedges. So um, it's definitely an upgrade. If, if Zanino's on the field, I feel pretty good about saying this is going to be fine. Um, they'll get better production from catcher next year than they did in 2022. Um, you're just really banking on him being healthy. And um, I don't know if there's any guarantee he's going to repeat 2021 either. Like that, there's a chance that was his best season and he's already passed it. Um, 33 homers, a 134 WRC plus. Uh, but he has had two four win seasons. That's the second time he's had a four win season. Nearly three. Yeah, he yeah in 2014 in 131 games he had a, a, almost had a four win season. I mean, shoot, Cleveland would probably take um, his 2018 season where he hit 20 home okay. runs and had an an 83 WRC plus. Austin Hedges has, has only one season been better than that, and that was uh, in 2018 before Cleveland had him. He is his way to runs created plus has been half that his time with Cleveland. So I think almost by default this has to be an upgrade by health. But um, I know you pulled up the numbers on the best catchers over the last several years or the best hit or worst hitters over the last several years, the uh, catchers, the last, since I went back to 2017 for catchers, um, Austin hedges has a 58 weighted runs created plus since 2017. That is 41st among catchers with a thousand plate appearances since then. Um, only, only above Tony Walters and Sandy Leone, who's Sandy Leone was here last year for a little bit uh, below Roberto Perez, below, Stephen Vogt, below Tucker Barnhart, below Max Stasi, below Jonathan Lucroy, um, even below you know below Danny Jansen and um, Mike Zanino comes in at nineteenth at ninety five in that time. So his uh, his his numbers during that time were 204, 276, 440. If Cleveland gets a ninety five weighted runs created plus out of Mike Zanino this season, it's an upgrade. It's 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 going from a you know a failing a failing grade a, a black hole at catcher to I don't know. You're getting close to league average production. So it's uh, a C. I don't know. You're just barely passing. It's definitely not the upgrade that Sean Murphy was going to be, who, by the way, you know, since 2017, 116 WRC plus fourth among catchers in that time, tied with Buster Posey, JT Romuto, and behind Wilson Contreras and Will Smith. So, but that tells yeah, you. you- that was the drop off there, and and all the catchers that could have been available are not on this list. Like Danny Jansen is there, uh, he's barely above Zanino, but like Christian Vasquez, not not above Mike Zanino. Um, who are the other catchers out? Omar Narvaez is, is it was a little bit above him, but I don't think Cleveland was looking at him. It was very a very limited list in terms of who was going to be an upgrade, unfortunately. And you know, I think we both said from the beginning it was probably Murphy or Zanino, and you know, here it is. Yeah, and you know, just for some fun context, uh, in 2021, you know, just two years ago, uh, Zanino had the higher WAR that year. He was the more valuable player by FanGraphs WAR. And listen, uh, massive injury for Zanino last year. Uh, a rare injury, a weird injury. He only gets to play in 36 games. So using any of his stats is kind of a bit predatory. It's someone who wants to kind of make a stat, make a fact that he's not good. So if you see someone like really using his stats from last year to make a point, uh, you got to question what, why other than to make him look bad. But having said that, he still outperformed Austin Hedges last year offensively. So even though he was a weird injury, short year, worst year of his career, he was still better than Austin Hedges offensively. So, there's no way where this isn't a rebound. And honestly, if he has like an 80 runs created plus at 6 million for catcher, that's a win. Um, I, I just want to kind of underscore that. And, you know, a lot of prediction sites have him in the the 80s. And if his defense rebounds, uh, you know, anyone get mad about like his pop time and framing. Imagine how hard all of that was to do with the injury he had. And again, that injury is the one thing we can't predict. But I'm going to actually disagree with Justin because I don't think no matter how bad this deal goes, it can't be worse than hedges because you can't be worse than hedges. Even if he doesn't play uh, or, you know, it's going to be hard to get to the negative war that hedges accumulated last year because his bat was not bad. It was historically bad. I mean, that's one of the worst seasons offensively for a starter 
I believe in like modern era history, he was worth negative war. That being said, I'm still all for bringing him as a backup due to his familiarity and all the, you know, that clubhouse stuff he could do or like as a, a minor league guy. But I, I think if there's one big takeaway, Hedges has power. This is the one lineup of any in baseball that can afford, uh, that can bring in a guy with a high K rate and not kill them. They need power. He provides that if it's working, they need a defensive catcher. Who's an upgrade. He provides that potentially. And that's, that's kind of the tagline. And all of this is also a way of saying like, they believe in Bo Naylor quite a bit. They're not ready for him to start the year. They don't think he's ready. They're very good at judging when players are ready. So uh, this is a placeholder, but it's a placeholder with some nice ceiling and potential. And if things go wrong, he's only got to last you probably about half the year, right? Yeah, and then in which case you're turning to Naylor and you're hoping he's ready by then for sure. And and who knows if Naylor is going to get a timeshare before then. And real quick too, even if you, you're talking about you know not using last year's stats, if you look under the hood a little bit, um, his exit velocity, average exit velocity in 2021 when he had his break, a big season was 90.7. Last year it was 91.8. Uh, he had a his max exit velocity was close to the uh, was pretty much near his career norms. Um, hard hit rate was around career norm too. It was a little bit higher in 2021, but it was still around his career norm. So, I mean, even if X stats doesn't believe he really performed that well, um, some of the stuff under the hood still suggests that he was close to doing a lot of the same things he did in 2021. So, I think you could still bank on him hitting the ball ball hard when he does hit it. It's just a matter of, I mean, the strikeouts are going to happen no matter what. So, but like I said, if he's on the field, he'll be an upgrade, no doubt. And if you think this Cleveland front office didn't like use every resource they had available to like check in, have check him out, do all that stuff. You don't know the preparation this front office did. If they felt like he is in pretty good shape, I am sure they got to see him and um, we'll see. But I, I, end of the day, you and I both agree he's an upgrade and he was one of the top five catchers available in this market um, from the start, in my opinion, because again, I know some people are not happy about not trading with Toronto, but I'm going to say it from the rooftops. Alejandro Kirk is not a catcher anymore. Now with these rule changes, he is no longer going to be a viable catcher for teams. So unless you want a DH Kirk, wasn't an option. He never was an option. There's a reason why Zanino and Murphy, as Justin pointed out, and as he pointed out yesterday, giving credit again to Justin here. I'm not sure if he said on air or off air, because they've been only really linked to two catchers, Zanino and Murphy. Murphy deal happens, which we'll talk about in a moment in segment two, and they immediately pivot to Zanino. I, mean, I think, you know, A, it shows Justin's knowledge base, and B, it shows the plan that was in place. Uh, didn't mean for that to have slant rhyme, but what I do mean is for us to take a quick commercial break here, talk about one of our fantastic sponsors on this very show. And today, it is a Rushmore sponsor. It is our good friends over at Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there, from pro football to college to the college bowl season to base basketball and the World Cup. They've got it all at betonline.net. If you love sports podcasts, you'll find them there as well. They've got the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online where the game starts. And if we take a quick second and look at bet online, we talked about all the recent odds, but I wonder if they've updated their World Series odds. I'm going to swing over there and take a good look at our, our good friends and see if they have changed the odds for the Atlanta Braves. Uh, why am I not seeing Atlanta super high on this list? Oh, because that's odds to win the American League. No. You want to check and see what the odds uh, are Atlanta's, of Carlos Correa going to the Mets? <laughs> let's see if they got futures. Uh, let's see. It's Toronto, I feel like, took a slight move. They're now third after adding Bassett, uh, third in the ranks over there. But you can find out more at Bet Online for yourself. Okay, so Sean Murphy a lot came out today. And I know people are like, more Murphy. I think it is important to talk about Murphy. And I feel like I have to scream this from the rooftops. Trade prospect ranks don't really matter. Like teams don't care. Um, classic example that I wanted to bring up yesterday and forgot about when the guardians would trade Corey Kluber, the talk was when I talked to some angels people that if they had gone to the angels, it would have been Brandon Marsh it was a top 50 prospect at the time. If not a top, maybe top 60 said they went to Texas for Emmanuel class. A. 
now we're like, yes, that is the right move. They made the right move at the time. Everyone hated that deal. And you looked under the, you looked at rumored other deals and it didn't make any gall darn sense. Now it makes perfect sense. Um, Estuary Ruiz has the speed that these new rules are going to benefit. Oakland wanted him. Uh, he also fits the old money ball approach. He has a high walk rate. He has on base tools. Oh, he is not Stephen Kwan. I will say that again. He is not Stephen Kwan. But a lot of the things that made Stephen Kwan underestimated and made him not, you know, someone who was a top 100 prospect are there for Ruiz. He's got like, he's on base skills. He's more likely a corner outfielder. He is not big. There is not good power potential, but I mean, his, his walk rate doubled this year and he is absolutely havoc on the bases. And I've talked about before, Oakland loves athletes. They have been trying to add speed to their lineup for a decade now. They don't have speed. You can sit there and say Cleveland could have topped this, but we don't know what Oakland liked and Oakland wanted Ruiz. That's why this deal got caught back up is because they were almost just trying to get Ruiz out of um, Milwaukee without sending uh, Milwaukee didn't want Murphy or couldn't afford him. So they had to figure out a way. Uh, and, and the crazy thing is Milwaukee valued him enough that it wasn't just like, normally I think if you go, Hey, we're going to treat you Wilson Contreras for Ruiz. I thought, you know, Milwaukee would say, yes, they must have said no initially to get Piapas, who's an interesting high spin reliever. Um, you know, I don't know. He's not the best piece, but he's interesting. And to get Justin Yeager, who's left off the rule five, but he throws a hundred miles an hour. Like, those weren't nothing pieces. They got more than Contreras. So as much as everyone wants to Monday morning quarterback this, as much as everyone wants to say Cleveland could have topped it, uh, I'll, you know, I'll leave it to Justin to talk about some of what the rumors were that they wanted Cleveland. But even today, we found out like that St. Louis offer that we discussed on this very show was not true. They wanted Newt Barr or um, Brendan Donovan plus Gre- Uh It's crazy to me that the offer of Dylan Carlson was not Oakland didn't want him. I don't, I don't understand that, but they wanted, um, you know, they wanted very specific things. They wanted Newt Bar, not Carlson. They wanted Ruiz. Cleveland didn't have either of those guys to offer. They wanted, they wanted major league near ready bats. And you're saying Cleveland has that. They also clearly didn't want infielders. Like infielders have not been in vogue this off season. And that's something else we'll talk about maybe on today's show, maybe tomorrow. The Reds are so many shortstops. They're trying to trade them for outfield prospects and having no luck. Nobody wanted Cleveland shortstops. Nobody wants infield prospects right now. Um, it's a little bit weird, but I mean, everyone's built up their own war chest of them. Nobody really feels like they need, need them after targeting the last few years. So yeah, you know, that's, I think people have to take a step back and realize Oakland wanted weird, specific things. They got the guys they wanted. Could Cleveland have topped it? Yes. But I think the cost would have been a lot more than what the viewed cost was. Yeah. I mean, Zach Meisel of the Athletic has continued to say that Oakland was targeting Williams or Espino. Didn't even say Bybee, but they were targeting Williams or Espino. And and I know Zach does a good job of getting information from third party sources, so he's not getting you know any biased information um, from either team, especially from Cleveland. So um, always trust him and always trust Ken Rosenthal. I'm still blown away. I mean, this is a personal, and again, this is why teams value players differently. Like. You and I were both talking before we started recording that St. Louis was interested, wanted to give the Cardinals either Carlson or Donovan, but not both. And then they were willing to offer Graceffo and then a bunch of, and a couple other players. And Oakland decided they wanted Newt Bar, and that was why it was no deal, supposedly. And you and I were both like, well, I'd rather have Dylan Carlson than Newt Bar. But if that's true, Oakland really wanted Newt Bar, and they valued players differently and maybe there's a reason St. Louis didn't want to give up nude bars so that might make some sense um but you're right I mean you and I both love prospect rankings we've been we've done them in our life and um for, for fun and for for you know writing gigs and they are fun but they're really fun for public facing they're not done for private facing so like yeah you'll see some executives um look at those lists they might inform some of those lists like there's no doubt that there are prospect people from in or you know development people from inside the organizations across baseball that influence pipeline and baseball america and fan graphs because those outlets run their list by team contacts that they have 
Um, but you don't think those influence aren't those lists aren't influenced by those people for a reason? Like they hundred percent are influenced for a certain reason when those are passed through. So you really have to take those just kind of at face value and not um, anything deeper because they just don't mean anything on the internal because clearly teams value players differently. And we said it yesterday, just if, if, if Oakland was determined that they were going to get Williams or Espino, then I don't, I agree with not making that deal. It, it's, it's frustrating because the system is good. I know I saw people saying, oh, well, maybe Cleveland's system isn't that good. Maybe we're all ever people are overrating them. I don't think people are overrating Cleveland's system because they have good players, I think. Um, it's just a matter of what teams want in trade markets and what specific teams want. And we also talked about this at the beginning of the offseason, too. There are just not a lot of teams out there trading away good players right now. Like Oakland, Sean Murphy represents really the last player on the last team that's really tearing things down right now. Look look across the league. There is nobody in the AL East that's, tr- that's tearing down, right? Tampa Bay is always Tampa Bay. The Orioles are on the upswing finally. The Red Sox are in kind of purgatory. Kind of accidentally they, tearing it down? Yeah, they're making dumb decisions, but they're not looking to trade away good players. The Yankees no. are the Yankees. The Blue Jays are getting better. The Braves are amazing. The Marlins are trying to get better. The Mets are ridiculous, and now they're reportedly interested in Carlos Correa. The Nationals have already traded away all the players they have that were any good. The Phillies made the playoffs last year. The Reds are trying to build back up. The Pirates are trying to build back up. The Cubs are trying to build back up. The Cardinals are and Brewers are playoff contenders. Um, you can overlook anybody in the Central because they all stink except for the Twins, and even they're being weird, and you're not going to trade with those guys anyway. Um, the Angels are trying like heck to be good, then it never works. Um, the Mariners made the playoffs. The Rangers are spending mad money trying to make the playoffs. The Diamondbacks are sneaky, good, decent. They're not looking to tear down. The Dodgers, the Dodgers. The Giants are trying to win. The Padres are all in. The Rockies are stupid, but they have it's nothing. Chris to give Bryant, you. like they signed Chris also Bryant, and they to have build up. Yeah, they had nothing to give you. Oakland literally represents the last team that had major league quality players. They were looking to move in order to uh, start the rebuild phase. Nobody else is in the rebuild phase right now. Nobody. I mean, the, the Red Sox have screwed themselves in, in some ways, and the Rockies continue to shoot themselves in the foot, but it's like there's nobody out there. So, yes, maybe you should have risked the biscuit to go and get Sean Murphy because it was the last chance you had to use your – I don't know. Would you rather overpay for a Sean Murphy and – trade just because you needed to trade some of your prospect depth and, and shore up a position, would you rather overpay because there might not be another chance to make a trade like this, no matter what position, regardless, or would you rather say, you know, we just let's hold on and see what happens. Cause obviously Cleveland did, but um, it's hard to guess where they pivot from, from that prospect depth and what they do with it now. But um, there's just not, there's not a lot of trades out there that are going to be a match for them, regardless of how they treat trades. It's just, teams are all in this weird phase right now. It's been a, it's not, you know, I'm not saying Cleveland's not at fault for not being more aggressive and trying to find a way to make a trade. And maybe they should be a little less risk averse, but you know, teams, teams aren't trading certain guys for a reason and teams are in the position position they're in. You can't force them to make a trade. I think it's a perfect time to take our next break right here. And then I'm going to come back and give you a theory as you were talking that kind of hit me of why Cleveland may not be preferred for some trades, why it is that like Cleveland and Oakland maybe didn't match up. Um, But all that after a quick break on today's episode of Locked on Guardians. And so, you know, hearing you talk and, you know, we talked about the line system. No, it, it's good. It was all good. Um, but hearing you talk kind of made something click in my head, which is, listen, trading the big three arms is dumb. Like just, and that's not what clicked, but Oakland wanted Ruiz because he has, you know, 70 grade speed, maybe 80 grade speed. Some of the other trades we've seen are like, teams are targeting kind of elite physical tools. And that often happens in these things like speed or power. Cleveland's miners doesn't have elite speed or power. Like they have elite contact rates. They're actually relatively, I would say, in terms of most um, top prospect pools, average athletically. 
Like it is not a prospect pool where you go through and go, that guy's a plus athlete. That guy, you know, is a plus. It's like, it's a lot of good fundamentals. It's a lot of good contact skills, which is something they're targeting. But in some ways, like, you know, uh, Gabriel Arias from two years ago when they acquired him, three years ago when they acquired him, whenever, now two years ago, would, might be more interesting than a Brian Rocchio because Arias was a plus plus defender with plus power potential. And Rokio is like average across the board. You know, it's like that. It that isn't what te- teams don't want to trade for average across the board. Like if it's a centerpiece, at least they can sit there and go. Ruiz has gotten better every year. Prospect ranks haven't had a chance to catch up with him. He is on base all the time. He stole eighty five bases last year. I think uh, he's just you know when you have that plus tool, teams tend to go out of their way to get that. And I think in a way, Cleveland's more balanced approach to the minors might make it a little less attractive outside of, you know, the big three arms because the big three arms are power type of arms. And and to go back to, if you read between the lines, honestly, it feels like Oakland asked Cleveland for Valera and either Williams or Espino. And if you look at the Rosenthal piece today, he said that, you know, they settled for Mueller when they couldn't get another infielder. And I I look at the, the, I, I assume they wanted Grissom, because that's the only other infielder of note anywhere in Atlanta. Because I don't think Atlanta is going to sit there and be like, oh, no, take uh, Mueller over Shoemake. Like, Shoemake doesn't – he's he's all right. He's probably a utility guy. So I assume it was like they pushed hard for Grissom. It didn't happen. They came back and revisited and settled for Mueller. But, I mean, even all the reports today were like, Tarnock's a reliever. Like, Atlanta viewed him as a reliever, maybe – or Oakland, that maybe he can be a starter. But it's like there's even talked already that Mueller is – you know, he'll get a chance to start, but he's probably – like, they, they really want a Ruiz. And guess what? Cleveland didn't have him. And Milwaukee desperately needed a catcher. I mean, they have Kiebert Ruiz, right? Like, they have a solid kind of backup. Milwaukee? Isn't it Kiebert? Or is it which? No. No, they've got they've got one of those guys who's like Kiebert, who was a former big-name prospect where he didn't become a starter, but is solid. Because Kiebert's with Washington. They now, have Caratini, right? and they had... Caratini, uh... that's it. Yeah, Caratini's who I'm thinking yeah. about. Because Carantini was a, a big name prospect with the Cubs, right? Like, I don't know. Like, I, Carantini and Kiebert Ruiz, on top of having some key sounds in their name, um, are somewhat similar to me, just for like both were viewed as potential starting catching. I mean, and that's maybe part of the lesson here. Like, both those guys, Ruiz and Carantini, were viewed to be as everyday guys, and they haven't been. Cleveland doesn't, unless they're flipping Bo Naylor to get, uh, which I don't know if that's necessarily what, um, Milwaukee would have wanted anyways because Contreras is at least a proven bat. But mm-hmm. it, it, this really seems to come down to they want a Ruiz and Cleveland didn't want to trade Valera. They didn't want to trade a top three arm. And I, I don't know. I have a hard time. I'm willing. I would have been willing to move on from Valera. I find a hard time trading pitching um, with the way it is. But yeah, I, I guess we've talked enough about Murphy's and Nino is fun. Uh, if he's even remotely the 2021 version, you're getting above average bat above average defense. And that's incredibly valuable. If he's not, you know, he, it's hard to not be an upgrade on Austin hedges. Uh, I know you had some other things you wanted to talk about here before we, uh, we do our end of audio podcast, but do our kind of after show on YouTube. Yeah, no, I am with you giving up Valera to me. If, if, if obviously Cleveland looks like they don't want to trade him, Valera doesn't even compare to Ruiz because, Ruiz is more of a, a high average speed center fielder. Maybe he's a center fielder. We don't know. I, I, there are a lot of places that don't think he's a center fielder, but I guess Oakland's going to find out. It, and they don't need him to be a center fielder. He could be a left fielder if they still believe enough in Pache to play center because obviously Pache's defense isn't the question. Um, but you, do you see the juxtaposition here or the, the differing um, skill sets here where Oakland was targeting speed and – Cleveland is looking at catchers who have great pop times like Murphy and and Zanino. That's why they passed up on baskets. You can clearly see where the league is going with these rule changes and um, the skill sets out there. Teams are valuing pop time and arm, or at least Cleveland is. And and Oakland is, is valuing speed right now. And Cleveland's best speed prospect is probably what Isaiah green. Like, that's the closest guy they have, if you're talking about just pure speed, to Asturi Ruiz, and Green is nowhere near the major leagues, and he may never, he is never going to hit the way 
Ruiz has. So that was never going to happen. Um, I don't know. Joe Lampy might have decent enough speed. And I think Nate Furman might have a decent enough speed, but those are, you know, 20, maybe guy lives come junior. So yeah. Even, to, even, yeah. I don't know if he has the speed of, of, a, a, no. a lamp or, a, um, a, even a Nate Furman, but like, Will Benson is a fantastic athlete. I don't think I don't think Oakland is like, oh, we want Will Benson. Like, obviously, they wanted a guy who could hit for high average and walk, and that is not Benson, even though he cut a strikeout rate down. Like, it's a different kind of athlete. The system they they must view players differently enough where there wasn't a fit. I don't know. Um, yeah, it's hard to say in the end here, but I'm I'm with you not trading the starting pitching and. I don't know. I, I like on one hand, you can believe if you're if you believe in your system and you believe that you're good at developing starting pitching, you could choose to bite the bullet and make that trade for Espino or Williams and not both and hang on to one of them. Plus, you still have maybe Bybee and Cantillo and Allen, even though they're of a lesser skill set. And you could just say, well, maybe we can, you know, find another Williams. I don't know if you could find another Espino. Espino is a unicorn. Um, that doesn't come around every so often. Maybe you would have said, okay, we'll give him Williams. But obviously they felt like that wasn't worth it. They want to get better pitching wise. Both those guys could be in the rotation as early as this year, maybe next year, depending on how they figure things out with pitching market, which we talked about because I have no idea how that's going to play out. But yeah, pitching has, has been the lifeblood of the organization. I guess things probably change. Like, do you it, let's say let's say Bo Naylor doesn't exist or Bo Naylor ends up as bad as he was in 2021? Let's say he never rebounded in 2022. You probably you, Cleveland probably makes that trade, right? They probably are willing to give in on that trade because now they have no options to catcher because Naylor looks like he flamed out in Double A and Lavasita had a bad yeah. year. Yeah. yeah, so maybe maybe the the calculus changes. Cleveland says we have nothing for catcher and. Let's trade one of these guys for catcher because Zanino or Zanino. Um, yeah, I think that's so. I think Naylor's presence is probably why they didn't make this trade. Um, but now it's going to be on on them banking on Zanino being healthy, and it's going to be on them believing that Naylor is as good as he says he is and when he's ready to take over. Because the other thing I want to talk about on the uh, post show on YouTube is what else they do at catcher from here on out. So. Uh, yeah, I mean they're not they're gonna try to not put too much pressure on Naylor and we'll see if they find another catcher and keep him at triple A, but um this clearly says they're you know Naylor's gonna be the guy sooner or later. And um you know, this is banking on him eventually being the guy they think he can be, and this is where it ends up. So if they don't make that trade, they didn't get the value they wanted, so now they've gotta hope their calculus is right on Naylor. Yeah, which is, I mean, honestly, it's a, it's a fast track for Naylor. And a lot of people ask me about Tyler Stevenson. Um, you know, could could the Guardians the Reds get aren't trading him? him? And the Reds, a the Reds aren't trading, but it took him six years to break into the big leagues. Like it is, uh, expecting Naylor to break in right away and be good is is a big ask. Um, we're gonna take our ending here, uh, as it were. We're gonna come back around to our locked on uh, extra show. So if you want a little more, you can jump in over on YouTube. I want to thank you for everyone who listened, rate and review, download daily. daily it helps. Uh, we're pushing 1,100. Um, I've got a funny story that I'm going to tell in segment in our after show about uh, giving some shout outs. Um, so tune in for that. Uh, I want to thank you all again and end it the way we end every show. Go, go, Guardians, go. Hey, we're back. So. I don't know if you saw my statements in our group chat, Justin, but I feel like I have to take a moment here and say hi to all of my students uh, who are watching the show. Today in the hallway, I felt like I was some kind of celebrity. It's like, you have a YouTube channel? I hear Mr. Ellis has a YouTube channel, Locked On Guardians. <laughs> so apparently uh, about five to 10 of our newest subscribers are some of the middle schoolers at my school. So, hey, um, I'm not gonna say your names on air because that might get me fired, but I am wearing a school shirt. So hopefully uh, this is a PG show. Everything will be fine. But uh, no, they have found that's really funny. A group of them uh, went so far as to tell me that uh, when they're doing other things on their Chromebook, and sometimes even at school, because they're smart enough to know workarounds for our security system, that they just play my our, us in the background all the time. They let the ads play. Uh, so we're getting about 10 to 15 view, uh, bonus views a day just from my students trying to help out. So thank you. Uh, I thought you would thank appreciate you. The, the humor of that. 
but uh yeah let's let's go into um you know the the catching of it all unless you want to talk about carlos cray and the mets oh geez no i don't oh my gosh i really don't want to go there that's crazy um well first of all we have to sit here and discuss who we think the player from the 40-man roster who gets cut to add um Mike Zanino, when, when the signing is official, who do, who do you think is, is the most likely odd man out here to add Mike Zanino, first of all, and then we can get into another catcher edition? Um, I think it's clearly Shane Bieber, right? You let go Shane Bieber. I mean, he's so close to free agency and he costs like $10.7 million. Someone will probably claim it. You can save some money. Save, yeah. Save some money. Um, sorry, as being a Yankees fan. Um, yeah. It's it's Palacios. The Jays fan. Uh, maybe they they replaced them now. It's uh, it's Palacios. It's Owen Miller. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of interesting. Maybe Will Benson. I, some people, I mean, are going to be angry at me about that, but like those feel like the three guys that I kind of. Uh, I, I was just going to take a peek at it. It's like there there is as our old friend Tony would say, there is no um, roster roster fodder. Roster fodder. <laughs> My my old, not, no. my old grunge band roster fodder. Um, you can catch us Saturdays at the the dirty, dirty someplace. I don't know. Um, the Odeon, Cleveland. <laughs> yeah. So speaking of places that are dirty, I did go to a few concerts there back in the day. But um, yeah. R.I.P. Odeon. Yeah. <laughs> or is it the Grog Shop? You know, they tore one of those down. I think it's the Odeon. I think the Odeon's gone. I can't remember. Hopefully they're not gone. They're not listening. But yeah, it's got to be. It's, I think it's got to be Palacios. Like I know some people are going to say Owen Miller, and he was yeah, bad he just last doesn't year. Have a position. Yeah, like Pal- like I said, we said this before on the show and, and on Twitter. Like they shoehorn Palacios into left field. He is like a left fielder only. They didn't play him at second, even though he still could. Um, excuse me there. Uh, and and how, how do you keep a guy that's a left fielder who can maybe play second on your team who has no power to speak of? Has some speed and contact ability. Like he's he's a major leaguer. I think there's a team out there who will put him on their bench. So I'm not saying they have to DFA him and he'll just clear waivers. He won't. I think that if they DFA him or even Owen Miller, somebody will take them. Yes. Uh, Miller just has more of a possible position because he can play first. And I know people were, were mad about his first base production last year, uh, even though Metrics liked him defensively, and I don't know how he is at second, but. You know, Miller has a better track record in the minors of hitting than, than Palacios. And he's right-handed. And this team is left-handed heavy. So not that Miller was good against lefties last year, but, you know, still. still. Um, I'd be, yeah, I would say Palacios has to be the guy. And I think you just, if you DFA him or you work out a trade with somebody for cash or international bonus money or, you know, another, I don't know, Ross Carver type situation, another a pitcher who doesn't need to be added till you know, 2024, you kick the can down the road a little bit on him. Miller would be number two. I guess it depends on they might try to put some feelers out there and see who they can move without having to get nothing in return. And I would hang on to Will Benson. I know that's kind of controversial, but there are other – he has everything else you want besides the hit tool, obviously. And he brought his strikeout rate down last year. So I want to see – if that's legitimate or not, I want to see what he does with that. I know he might not have a spot in the open day roster or position really, but um, I'm willing to see if he makes that stick and see what happens for now. And if you do end up moving on from him, he might have more value if you do that, because he might be able to prove to some people. So I'm saying Palacios for right now. Agreed. That's who I also thought would be the most likely one. Yeah. And then, okay, here, here's the other thing too. Is Cleveland going to bring another catcher in to pair with Zanino? Because right now your options to pair with Zanino are Naylor, Lavastida. Those are the only guys in the forty. If those aren't the guy, if neither of those guys end up being the backup or timeshare to to, to Zanino, and and maybe maybe you do bring in Naylor out of the gate. I don't know. Your other options are Mabry's Valora or bringing back Austin Hedges. But if you do that. You have to create one more roster spot, and after that, it's probably Miller and Blasios as well. So, I could see I could see Hedges coming back as a backup. I think 
he'll want to see what else is out there for him and see if anybody else is interested in giving him more playing time. Because if he comes back at this point, he's clearly going to be a backup. And he knows eventually he'll be usurped by Bo Naylor, whether it's in June or by the end of the year. Um, so does he want to sign up to play in a, in a city where he knows that his job is probably gone by the summer? That's a big risk. So I don't know. I think I think te- I think other catchers are going to sit there and say, you know, free agent catchers are going to sit there and say, well, you have Zanino and you have Naylor coming at some point this season. You want Naylor to play. So. I don't think they're going to be able to sign a free agent unless Austin Hedges is comfortable with, with that situation. Um, I think Hedges could get a backup job somewhere where he's not going to be cut at midseason, or at least he doesn't go in knowing there's a possibility of that, right? There's definitely a possibility he doesn't have a job at midseason here. Um, I think if they bring another catcher in, they're going to have to make a trade because that way you don't have to worry about convincing the, the guy to come here to lose his job. So I don't know who that is. Maybe... I don't know. Do you think there's still a chance they go out and trade Danny Jansen for Danny Jansen? Like, I know we said the numbers on him were down. Do you, it, it, I mean, Zanino was hurt last year. So you can say maybe that the reason pop time and, and stuff for him were down is because of the injury. But if you look at Danny Jansen, if you, if Cleveland believes that you can get regain what he had in 2021 with pop time and all that stuff, that's still a good player. And they're more likely to be a fit trade wise with Toronto than they are Oakland. I think. Yeah, no, I agree. I I think, and I brought this up on the, on, in, on, uh, this is the show, not on Twitter, I should say, but (laughs) on Twitter and on the show is I don't think this precludes adding another catcher because listen, Zanino has risk even at the best of times. Like he's a a catcher, you know, he had that great season playing in a 108 games. I mean, catchers don't play 120 games anymore. Uh, when I, I went and I was going through year by year, the funny thing was like I said a 200 at bat plate appearance minimum. And when I went to 2020 without thinking only one catcher qualified, Wilson Contreras, like there's not a lot of guys who are out there for a ton of at bats. Contreras also was a lot of DH that season. But yeah, I, I think, again, it might be hard to sign someone and like who's really left. Um, I mean, no, I, like I, said, I, think, and... I think they can get hedges because it, Hedges defense has been declining. Okay. Like it, I know people are like defense is matters and it does. And Cleveland clearly thinks it matters, but hedges is not the hedges of two years ago when he was head and shoulders better than every other catcher in this league. Um, he's a good defender, but like his framing data, his pop times, all of it's been in decline. Um, I think in 2021, honestly, Zaninos were better. Like I, I than hedges were that year. I, I think we're seeing some decline. So, you could probably get him. Uh, I think Jansen could still be a trade possibility, but if it's you believe be, you can turn him around, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and you know, it's also that hybrid role we talked about, which is, hey, you know, um, and then you go and you trade for Dalton Varsho. So then there's your third string catcher, and not everyone has to play every day, and you can just they can make this. Jeez, but uh, you know, uh, hey, if the Astros can trade for him, then Cleveland definitely can. I'm just going to state that. Um, but, uh, the one problem with this whole idea of like, okay, so like on some days, um, when they're facing lefties, you want Jansen. And, um, if you're to trade for it, you'd want Jansen and, um, Zanino, Zanino, I'm having a brain fart moment in the lineup. And then you maybe have, uh, like Jansen catch Zanino DH your first baseman is, uh, is bell, you know, you make it work. Like there's, there's a weird flexibility that gives you, even though they're both right-handed because the rest of the lineup is so left-handed. Um, mm-hmm. there, there's definitely ways they can make it work. It doesn't mean they have to, but I mean, you look at some of the lack of depth some teams have, like I almost feel like go find, I mean, I was trying to think whose roster resource I was looking at where I was like, sweet, sweet, you know, wh- whatever epitaph you want to put on that. I don't want to get myself in trouble. Like they just had nothing there. And it's like, especially with some of these teams, like go out and add some more pieces or make you know, like a team that goes and trades for Brian Reynolds. I don't really think he's out there. If I'm honest, I don't think Pittsburgh's really listening, but if someone traded for him, like that team might need depth. And then you could maybe move a Miller or, you know, the same way this team moved Mark Matthias, who was Matthias, who's still bouncing around occasionally getting time in the big leagues. Um, there's always value in having depth guys. Uh, there's ways to make it fit, but yeah, I think they need pieces. 
Yeah, I, I would still be interested in trading for Jansen and seeing what happens with that. I mean, I, I don't know how much the trade market is going to look for him based on what happened to Murphy because, again, it's hard to compare the two because the o- Oakland clearly wanted a very unique package for for Murphy and they were asking for different things. Um, who knows with Toronto? Toronto knows Cleveland's system well, and I don't know what Toronto, Toronto's going to want Major League help too. Depends on what they'd be wanting to, wanting to give up. But I still think there's a world where they can trade for Jansen. And I, <clears throat> I don't know. I, I'm wondering, Hedges may not have an option if he wants a major league job because um, there may not be anybody else out there willing to sign him. But I think also look at, you know, like I said, he knows that maybe by June, July, the ideal plan for Cleveland would be to bring up Naylor. And that would be the end of Austin Hedges in Cleveland. And, Maybe they could find somebody else who wants him as a backup. Well, you know, who knows? But I do think I wonder if he'd approach it with some skepticism because he knows his job might be gone by midseason if if they go as planned for Cleveland. And they would be honest with him. They were honest with him about bringing other catchers in last season. So who knows? But yeah, I think there's still a chance they could look for somebody else out there. It really depends. But you know they have to find a way to create more room. So you could see both Miller and Palacios go. Um, Toronto still wants a second baseman. Maybe they like Tyler Freeman. Maybe they like, uh, mm-hmm. you know, anybody, I guess they have what Merrifield, but I guess there's other positions they would consider other players they would consider because he can play the outfield. You know, something I completely forgot about and just recently had me as we're talking about Zanino is I feel like they probably have some discourse still with Kevin Cash, right? Like there's probably some additional information that came through. I'm sure right. Cash, you know, additionally said some very um, good things about him. And oh, I'm sure. also, and also think about like how good that staff played for Zanino, like all the things that kind of matter, um, I think are also there. So yeah. it's just something to something that hit me that we didn't discuss in the main show. I'm like, oh, that's probably something we should uh, consider here. I what's going on here? I was just kind of curious. Um, I think uh, you I'm made just, another not to not to steer you off of your point, but I think you make another good point about finding another hitter. It's still pretty obvious they have room to add a hitter to this lineup around this roster, right? Like they're still an opening here in the major league roster to get a better player, you know, you still have Can I throw a name at you. That could be a weird name, but might make sense. Sure. Okay. So here's my weird name. Uh, Eduardo Escobar. Eduardo Escobar. If of the Mets mm. switch hitter hits lefties better than righties has a team option for next year, makes 10 million this year. So not that expensive, but one of six ones created plus, I mean, he's not like super exciting, but you know, he also did hit 20 home runs last year, 28 the year before 35 the year. I mean, they need more power. The on base stuff isn't great, but he is another way to potentially get power and someone else who hits lefties. Um, these, you know, better than righties for his career. Um, when I was looking at some of his split stuff, uh, and the Mets might be needing to cut a little payroll. So it's like, and they're a team that could need depth. Like there could be a world where at Escobar's age, it's like you could trade some of those spare parts and pieces and maybe clear a roster spot and add a useful player. I would be interested, but I don't, I don't see the Mets moving him because I think they'd rather have him on the bench, uh, replace him as make him a bench player. If they were to sign Correa, that gives them more depth. I, I, if I, I were mean, them, the talk today was already that they're trying to move Carrasco to save money. And I was just, I was reading the athletic piece that yeah. said that specifically named McCann, Carrasco and Escobar. As oh, guys okay. that they will I didn't know move. that. So okay. that I should, maybe I should clarify. I set you up. I apologize. But that's yeah, okay. I mentioned three players. Um, so I was like, if he's available, it's kind of an interesting hypothetical. Like if he hits well enough, it's a team option, which could appeal and do 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 not, not do do my one-year-old's upstairs due to him being 33 soon to be 34. Like he can't be that big of a, of an ask and, and even look at his, let's see for his, he's weird because he has like, he has hit against a very small sample size, but like he has chosen to not switch hit like once or twice early in his career. But um, against lefties, a 108 career runs created plus against righties a 92. So you know, he is a switch hitter. Um, so that would be fun to add to the lineup with Bell and, and Jose. 
Um, so it's just an idea, uh, someone who you could maybe use that borderline roster fodder to go out and add a, uh, a switch hitter who could also, you know, play some third base, play some DH, you know, let Jose rest a little bit. I think that's something that they want to concentrate on, um, especially as he's recovering from everything with his thumb. I was trying to see uh, when was the last time he played anything. And the Mets need outfield depth too. So that's, uh, yeah. you know, good place for Palacios too. I'm not Palacios. saying Palacios would get it done, but yeah. But it's like Palacios, uh, I, Miller, and maybe, it, it, like, I mean, I have no idea. This is just, it's like Palacios, Miller, and maybe a reliever. Like, they still need some relief help, I, I want to say, on that team. So it's like, not a not a good one, but, and not a bad, I mean, they're all decent, but it's like, Eniel, yeah. Eli Morgan, does one of those guys kind of get you there with, like, parts and pieces yeah. while also allowing the Mets to save money because you're also doing that in the kind of weird world. <laughs> um. Yeah, I don't know. It's and I mean, I guess we should mention the Carrasco thing, right? Like, my heart wants him to come back, and the numbers were okay, but like he would be the fourth starter here. And you've also like got to move. You got to move, please, Zach or Savali. And I yeah. honestly, as much as I like Cookie, <clears throat> I would rather move, please, Zach or Savali, and give uh, yes. a rotation spot to Cody Morris. I'm sorry. No, it's my heart wants him here, but. The 14, I think it's 14 million is it's not a ton, but like, I mean, it, in this market, it's a bargain, but it is. that's the other thing. It's like, you know, I, I want him because he's cookie and he was just yeah. one of like, you know, he wanted to be here. He is like Jose, whenever anyone craps on Cleveland, it's like those two guys wanted to be here. Um, I will always love them for that, but uh, yeah, like, like I said, it, it's okay. If your heart wants cookie, my heart wants cookie, but understand it just, it doesn't make a lot of sense, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you could move Plesak and Savali and go with Morris and Carrasco, that would be ideal. But I don't know if you can trade one, let alone the other, just because I don't know. We haven't seen the pitching yeah. trade market come out yet, so I'm not and I'm not sure. Um, that would be an upgrade to me, but it just depends on I don't know. <laughs> Are the and the Mets aren't going to be eating? They want to save money, so they're not going to be eating yeah. the money from yeah. Carrasco so like and nearly Esther five million. Bird. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they're not eating the money on that either. In those so, two pitchers. I don't know. Here. No. But um, yeah, I just thought, uh, you know, Escobar's a new name. I've kind of liked him for a, a while. Um, but at, at 10 million, that's not an obscene amount of money. And he gives you that, uh, I don't know, for some reason, more switch hitters in the lineup just tickles my fancy. I don't know if it's, it's actually that great. It's not great over Miller on the bench for sure. I yeah. would rather have Escobar than Miller, especially because Escobar can probably play more positions and yeah. has a it's like major league bat. every time you face a lefty, he could play at third and you give Jose the day at DH. Like you'd have a system built in like that to let him get less time in the field that way. And then you could, like I said, the, I was wanted to look at his fielding just to see the last, he hasn't played outfield in a few years, but he has played in the outfield. Um, yeah. You know, we've seen them throw guys in the outfield. who have never played there. He's played right. He's played center. He mostly played left back in 2015. Uh, he played short uh, a year ago, but it's mostly third and a little bit of second. But I mean, he's he's so sogged, logged significant innings at at first, second, third, shortstop, and outfield through his career. So um, versatility this team preaches about. So just kind of another name to throw out there. Um, I still think you know. Go back to the discussion I had on my Thanksgiving show. It's like. A perfect guy for this team would have been Urshela, uh, not because of the defense, but just because of, uh, I mean, how good he was as a right-handed bat a few years ago. Now, Minnesota was never going to trade him here, but, uh, you know, before he went to the Angels, but like Escobar in some ways is, has some similarities there in what you would get. Yeah, I mean, now that they've signed Bell, I definitely would not have any interest in Urshela, even as a utility guy, but you're right, maybe on the bench he makes some sense. Um, he could have, but. Um, do you want to discuss potential trades, not potential trades, but Cleveland trying to find a way to move pieces in their farm system and tr try to find a back? Cause I think I, like we said, there is still room for them to add a hitter to this lineup and Escobar is one of them, but do you want to discuss that today or do you want to put it? We can't push it off to tomorrow. Can we? Cause we have Tim Heron tomorrow. Tomorrow is Tim Heron. So I think maybe we save that for our Thursday discussion and if we have a special guest on uh, when we talk on Thursday for Friday show. So Thursdays, yeah. this, this is Wednesday show. It always kind of throws me. Yeah. Uh, we'll have Tim Heron tomorrow, which we probably should tease at the front of the show. This is a bad job by us. I'll put it in the show notes. Um, but 
either we'll talk about it Friday or we'll have a back to back special guests. And then uh, we'll talk about it next week. Cause let's be honest. I think um, we're kind of heading, heading a little bit into the holiday tune down. Uh, I thought there was a yeah. really interesting piece on the athletic about this might trigger some people, but like in the middle of the baseball season, both Chernoff and Antonetti took a week off and went on like family trips and um, how they're like preaching the importance of that to their peers. So I think there's a degree of with a lot of players, a lot of uh, these managers that like, no, I need to take some time for me. So I think we might actually see the wheels start to slow down here anyways. So I think it might be something we just save. Uh, uh, you know, I'll give the fans a hint, though. Uh, Brian Reynolds, not part of our discussion. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Oh, we're shifting. I don't know. I, I, I was going to bring it up, but I guess we'll, people will have to wait now. Yeah. OK, I guess we got a, a different uh, uh, we got some differing views on that. But uh, fans, fans are thirsty for him. So, hey, they'll uh, they'll be happy. But, yeah, I think at almost an hour, it's best to, you know, uh, almost an hour and almost what uh, your time. It's approaching. Uh, it's it's approaching midnight. Right. Because yeah. 11. Um, so yeah, we're going to call it and we want to thank everyone who stuck around. Uh, if you stuck around to the end, comment below. Uh, if I, I need to see, uh, the, the Christmas movie stuff's falling off. Come on, people give me something more than Die Hard and Christmas story. What else would I like to see in our comments? Uh, listen, we, I've talked about my Christmas nerding vacation. out. Christmas vacation is a classic. I've talked about my nerding out. You know, you can see all the board games. You can see the lightsaber. If I lean, you can see the Ninja Turtles uh, arcade cabinet that's at the height for my kiddo right now. Uh, give me some of your nerd stuff. Let's let's lean into the nerd of it all. Also throw your favorite nerd things. I'm always looking for new uh, nerd books to read. So, uh, yeah, leave those in the comments as well. Thank you all. Uh, I guess I should do a... Oh, uh, and then just going to call this right now on the 13th of December, 2022. Uh, in June, in the uh, second round, the Cleveland Guardians are drafting Miles Naylor, uh, I believe outfielder, maybe. Am I wrong in that? Uh, uh, third base as of now. Third base. Okay. Third baseman. Or shortstop. I don't know. Uh, basically the third Naylor brother. And in the first round, Colt Emerson from Glen, Ohio. Let's just go the whole way. Let's, 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 let's call two. When do they right take now. Tanner Hall? Fifth round? Fourth round? Um, I'm getting nerdy already. Yeah, maybe, maybe I think fifth is probably a good one, right? That's where they've had some of their good success ones. Yeah, third um, or the, fifth. the the other The other guy, if I'm really really being honest about, as I was going through, uh, if you missed it, MLB Pipeline released their top 100, and I like to per peruse that a little. Uh, I think the guy that I realize I'm super high on that they are not is Jerron Watts Brown. That's that's one of my guys to watch. They, I thought he was a sure like top twenty ish pick, and they have him at forty. Um, so, but yeah, there's a there's an Ohio kid who's projected to go in the first round. There has not been an Ohio batter who has gone in the top three rounds in like a decade. So that's kind of fun. And again, a third Naylor brother. So just put it on the board. Uh, I've been Jeff Ellis. We'll, we'll we'll have plenty of time to talk draft. Trust me. Uh, if you think I'm not going to get real nerdy on the draft, that's coming. Uh, let us know what else you want us to get nerdy about. You know, the comments are a great way to give us ideas. We will totally take things and run with things. Um, again, contrary to what people think, we do like each other. There is no no friction here. We're just two dudes having fun talking about things and uh, disagreeing about two and a half percent of the time, I think. So, uh, yeah, um, have fun. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. Stay warm. And uh, go, go, Guardians, go.